We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, and we will begin reading with verse 10 of this chapter. I, uh, you know, the Bible says in Matthew 4.4 4, and Luke 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's why we preach verse by verse through the Bible. So many churches, they just kind of pick and choose and here and there. They kind of stay with their own little theme. You know, you can make it, hang on, you'll get through the storm, it'll be okay. It's more like therapy than it is really church service. Well, how many know we're not here to give therapy, we're here to give Jesus Christ who is the Lord, King of Kings and Lord of Lords of all therapy and redemption by the blood of the Lamb. And so, I, as I said earlier, I'm comfortable when I preach behind the pulpit. I, the Lord has blessed me with His blessing, His anointing. I appreciate it so much what He does for me. But I will say that today I'm a little bit uncomfortable where I'm at, simply because divorce and remarriage is everywhere. And... Uh, Probably most of the people in this room actually has been through a divorce or a remarriage or separation. Not all of you, but some of you. And those of you that have not, you ought to thank God that you haven't. And so, you know, it's important that we understand the truths of God's Word. I, I, it's, it's a horrible thing when you look at the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, how God told Moses that he would tell the people to write a bill of divorcement for a wife if they were unpleased and found uncleanness in them. And um, when you get in our society today, there are some churches that have went overboard and they have made divorce and remarriage stricter than the Old Testament and brought it to a place where uh, people cannot live up to what has happened in your life. And uh, we're going to begin reading verse 10. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm glad Jesus lives up to everything we need. Verse 10, And his disciples say unto him, If the case of, of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. Now, this is a saying, he says, not all men can receive. For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there were eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Then, there, then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them, and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, Suffer the little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he, de he laid hands on them, the children, and departed thence. I want to use for a subject this morning, singleness and remarriage. You may be seated. Singleness and remarriage. God meets you in your now. Remember that. God meets you in your now. He doesn't meet you in your past. God meets you today. He meets you now. He doesn't meet you in your past. He meets you now. And so if you've been divorced and remarried, Make the best of your marriage, enjoy the married life, and live for sweet Jesus. Amen. If you've been divorced and you're not remarried, but yet it was for biblical grounds, then you're free to marry again. But you don't have to. Because singleness is something that is absolutely beautiful. The gift of singleness is spectacular. If you're sitting in this room and you're a single person, you're living a life of singleness, yes. uh, if I had a hat, I'd tip it off and throw it out. My hat's off to you. <laughs> the truth is, anybody can feel the urge and reach out and get married rather than to burn. 
That's what Paul said. It's better to marry than to burn. But it takes a special gift from God to live a life of singleness. And people who don't look at single people as being different from you or lower class than you. Don't look at that. The truth is, a single person is at the height of their glory. Did you know that Jesus was a single person? Did you know Paul lived the life of singleness? So don't tell me that there's something wrong with someone that's single. Maybe they've chose to do so, or maybe God has not brought them to the place where he wants them to marry or remarry. So if you're in this room and you're single, you're a special person. And if you're living a life of singleness, you're even more a special person. We're told in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, uh, the rabbi uh, Shammai, Shammai rather, believed that you could not get a divorce, leave your wife, except it be for fornication or uncleanness. The rabbi Hillel believed that you could get a divorce for any reason. Jesus Christ did not side with either one of them. He sided with the book of Genesis. And said that God made Adam and Eve and put them together and they were to live a beautiful life together until death do them part. Marriage is a very sacred, very beautiful thing and there is only two reasons in the Bible for grounds for divorce. Just two. The first one is fornication or pornea which is adultery. Pornia is the same word you get, porn. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14 says, those that are caught up in sexual mischief, their eyes are full of adultery. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on, but I want to share with you that God meets you in your now. You remember the story about the woman that was taken in adultery, they were going to stone to death? Well, God meets, God met her in her now, in her, at the time in which they were going to stone her. I want you to know God meets you in your now, not in your past. And he blesses your life now, and he sends a shockwave to your past, shattering the past and erasing the past, because every day with Jesus Christ is a new day. Your past may be dark, it may be ugly, it may be turbulent. Your today may even be messy, but your future's whiter than snow, pure, holy, because of Jesus Christ. Here and forward, you are extremely blessed and forgiven of God if you will only trust him. The lady was caught in adultery. Remember, they were going to stone her, and Jesus Christ said, okay, you're not... Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. He does not sin, cast the first stone there in John chapter 8. And every one of them had to walk away. Why? Because every one of them had a dirty present, not just a dirty past, that a dirty present. Their today was filthy. And not a one of them could throw a rock. The only one that could have stoned that woman to death was Jesus Christ himself because he was the only perfect one. And Jesus Christ said to them after they all walked away, he said to the woman that was taken in adultery that they wanted to stone, he said, where are your accusers? Have none condemned you? She said, no, no one's condemned me. And Jesus Christ met her at her now and said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Woo! I, um, I want to make a few observations before we get into this. In fact, John chapter, there, there are people that believe if you get a divorce and remarried, then you still, or you're still married to the person you divorced. There's people that believe that. There's people that preach that even today. Marriage creates a new identity. Divorce dissolves the past identity. A legal marriage forms a marriage. A legal divorce dissolves that marriage. Adultery does not dissolve a marriage. Divorce dissolves a marriage. We need to understand that when someone commits adultery or violates a sin against their mate, their spouse, 
You're not commanded to divorce them. You're permitted to. But Jesus Christ gives us the value of marriage. And he's trying to say you can salvage it. You can find forgiveness. You can find restitution. You can find uh, the blessing of the Lord. And you can correct what's wrong in your marriage. Let me tell you, friends, your marriage, if you're going through a hard time right now, your marriage is worth saving. And the older you get, the more you'll appreciate that you rescued and saved your marriage through the power of Jesus Christ. Um, there are those that hold tightly to the fact that if you're divorced, married, then you're still married. Do you think, there's people that think you've got two or three wives or two or three husbands. Whew, I can't. <laughs> One of them's enough. But anyway. John chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, you know the story of the woman at the Jacob's well? And remember, Jesus is plucking her feathers. He's dealing with her, trying to bring her to the truth of the gospel, trying to bring her to the truth of who the Messiah is. And remember, Jesus said to that woman at the well, go call your husband. And she responded and said, I have no husband. And Jesus Christ sounded back in verse 17 and 18 of John 4. Thou hast answered correctly. You have no husband. You have had, thou hast had. Everybody say had. Yeah. He didn't say thou has. He says thou hast had. Right. It doesn't say thou has five wives or five husbands. It says thou hast had five husbands. And the one you're living with now is a shack up. Just preach it like it says. Amen. Hello. We live in a society that just wants to shack up. Well, listen to me. You need to get married. Serve the Lord if you're going to shack up. You need to get married. Make it legal. You say, well, it's just a piece of paper. Well, so's your money. I'll take all your pieces of paper today. So's the abstract. So's the title to your car. Just bring them in. Just paper. That's good. Yeah, it's a legal document. And Jesus Christ was not saying a legal document of divorce is not valid. He just says, don't jump at it because there's only two reasons for it. And one is fornication, adultery, and the other one is abandonment because you're a Christian. These two Grounds for divorce, fornication, adultery, which is pornea, the word Greek pornea, meaning sexual mischief, and number two, abandonment because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Your mate abandons you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the only two reasons that Jesus Christ gives us for divorce. But if someone gets a divorce, is it legit? Does it sever? The previous marriage? And the answer is yes, it does. If they remarry under the bad circumstances, it is a sin. If they marry because of lusting for another or the wrong reasons, yes, it is a sin, but it is not a perpetual sin. It is an act of sin. And the act of remarriage dissolves any previous marriage. In fact, the divorce dissolves the, the marriage. And so no one in this room that's been married and divorced and remarried, you don't have two spouses. You just have one. Take good care of her or him because that's the one God wants you to stay with for the rest of your, rest of your life. Amen? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and Titus chapter 1, verse 6 says that a bishop must be the husband of one wife. And there are those that teach that people had more than one wife. Well, they did in that day of Apostle Paul, but they literally had more than one wife. They lit, some of them had four or five wives. And Paul was trying to say, if you've got more than one wife, you've got too much to do already. Just skip bishops. Just skip it. 
But he's not saying that there's a fault in divorce and remarriage. He's just saying, Paul is just saying, you can't have polygamy. You can't have two wives or three wives and be a bishop. In fact, that's still going on today. So preacher, what's that got to go do with me? Hold on, I'll get you here in a minute. We'll get a hold of you. We'll show you what the scripture is actually saying about divorce and remarriage. God meets you at your now. So whatever you're in, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, whatever place you're at, if you're divorced for the wrong reasons, then you're to stay divorced. If you're divorced and remarried, and it was for the wrong reason, you're to stay married. Nothing is to change. You stop where you're at, and you walk with Jesus Christ. You love Jesus Christ and you honor Jesus Christ. And you say, well, what, what if it's not God's will for me to be married to this person? It is. If you're married to him, it's God's will. Because for you to do anything other than that would be disobeying the scriptures. Thus, it is God's will for you to stay with the one in which you are married to now. Hello? If a, let's say a man gets married and divorced, married and divorced seven or eight times. And the person he marries and divorces seven or eight times, both of them are unsaved. When they get saved, all of that's washed away. And they're free either to marry or free to, they, they are to stay married if they're married. They are not married, they're free to marry again. A new slate in Jesus Christ. Now, not everybody will agree with what I'm saying, but let me go back here and say this. If your spouse commits adultery, you are not commanded to divorce your spouse. You are allowed to, but you're not commanded to. Your marriage is worth saving. Amen? Amen? Amen. Divorce is ugly, and it's ugly on children. It's ugly on the church. It's ugly on you. Divorce in many ways, is like a death. It is. It's like a death. And so divorce is a very ugly thing, mostly ugly to the children. So go for a godly marriage. Amen? Now, we're going to talk about something that I feel is forgotten in the Scripture. So, uh, not forgotten, but people have forgotten it. And that is, singleness is not the same, uh, single is not the same as singleness. Let me say that again. Single is not the same as singleness. Let me explain something to you. A person, everybody in this room has been single. One time or another, you've been single. If for some reason you're widowed, for some reason there's been a divorce, you haven't remarried, for some reason, you've chosen to be a bachelor or a bachelorette. It's the gift of singleness. Singleness is not the same as single. Judy and I have been married 48 years, a little over 48 years. 46 of those years... Judy and I have been saved, born again. There was two years of our life that we were not Christians, of our married life. Two years of our married life, we were not Christians. Forty-eight years of going strong. I started preaching when we had been married 46 years. Judy and I had been married for... Ten and a half months when our first son came. We've been married two years when my first, Judy and I's first daughter came. You say, why are you saying this? I'm trying to say I know what it's like to be single. I know what it's like to be married. I know what it's like to be married before I was saved. I know what it's like to be married after I'm saved. 
So, you know, that doesn't make me a professional at what I'm talking about because we're all learning, we're growing, aren't we? Yeah. Amen. Amen? But if you'll hang together long enough, you'll grow on each other. I get tickled with husband and wives. They tend to start looking like each other. They tend to start talking like each other. Amen? The skinny wife marries the skinny husband. And when they get older, you got fat wife, fat husband. Except in my case. I've got skinny wife, fat husband. Single, being single is amazing, but usually when you're single, you're, you're trying to decide what you want to do in life, and you're in the dating scene. Trust, tr I trust that you're behaving. And being single, it is your time to sort out what you want to do to decide whether you're going to be married or you're going to be living a life of singleness. Singleness is... What you choose to do if you do not marry. Singleness is what you choose to do. Singleness can be what you choose to do. It can be because of a divorce and you haven't remarried. It could be because of widow. Your loved one, your spouse has died. And you find yourself in this status of singleness. Now, a widow can remarry. Many widows choose to remain in singleness. And let me say this real quick. Singleness is a gift from God. Singleness is a gift from God. Not everybody can live a life of singleness. But singleness comes through a choice. It comes through a tragedy of divorce. It can come through a time of death for a spouse. You find yourself living a life of singleness. It's different than being single because you've had the both the best of two worlds. And now you've got to decide whether or not you're going to remain single, which would make you live a life of singleness, or whether you will remarry. A widow can remarry. A divorced person under the right circumstances can remarry. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But Jesus is trying to point this out to the eunuch. Everybody know what a eunuch is? Let's, let's look at this for just a minute so we'll know what a eunuch is for sure. I don't want to get down into the surgery part, but... <laughs> Hello. Verse 12 says, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb." So some people are born without sex drive. Some people will be born like a eunuch, no sex drive or very little sex drive. He is not saying that you will prefer same sex. He is not saying some are born as eunuch from their mother's womb. He's not saying that you prefer the same sex. He's not saying that you have a sex drive. What Jesus Christ is saying, you don't have a sex drive at all. You have no desire. You were born without sex drive. Now, if you have a sex drive for the, for the same sex, you're perverted. Your mind is perverted. Because there's no such thing as alternative lifestyle, you know, same-sex marriage. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I've got this book right here, and it's, it, it trumps it over rural Supreme Court. And by the way, the Supreme Court needs to read this Matthew chapter 19. In fact, the only mutilation of a eunuch is by men in order to remove their sex drive. Notice it says in verse 12, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. In other words, they were castrated. They were made to be no sex drive, or at least very little sex, sex drive. They would do that. Kings would do that so the, the men wouldn't bother their, their women. Remember Candace the queen and what was it in uh, Acts chapter 8, I believe it is, that the eunuch, 
the Ethiopian eunuch, he had, he had had surgery or he was born without sex drive. He had chose, either chose a, a life of singleness or he was given a life of singleness. Notice it says, there are some which have made themselves eunuchs of the kingdom of heaven for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So we know that there's three things here. Number one, you can be born without a sex drive or very little, which does not give you permission to have same-sex marriage or to be changed into a different sex. It just means you were born without a sex drive or very little. And then you have the other where it's made a eunuch by men that have done that many times. They did that in war. In fact, Daniel was one, a eunuch. In the Bible, Daniel was a eunuch. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were eunuchs. The king would make them eunuchs to take care of their, their, their kingdom. And then there's those that just choose not to remarry, or they choose not to marry at all. And that's why I salute you. If you've chosen not to marry, if you've chosen not to remarry, you have a special calling of God. And it is the gift of singleness. Many, many uh, widows are given the gift of singleness. Too many times a widow remarries too quickly. And they marry the wrong person. And then they don't have time for their grandchildren or their children. And then there's a mixture. And then there's a problem. I would say to every um, widow, give it time. See if the Lord's going to give you the gift of singleness. If you can't receive the gift of singleness, then you're free to remarry, of course. But trust me, you can do all them things you wanted to do, but you couldn't do because of your working, your family, your children. Once that spouse has gone to be with the Lord, you can do many things that you never could do when you were trying to make a home. So the gift of singleness can be a real blessing to some. Others can't do that. There's people that just can't stand to be alone. They just cannot stand to be alone. And because of that, I would say they do not have the gift of singleness. Amen? I want to point out some things. And here... I do believe that there's two grounds for divorce. Fornication, which is pornea, a word pornea could take in porn, could take in eyes full of adultery. It could take, it's not just the actual act of jumping in bed with someone. It is actually being unfaithful to your wedding vows in your heart, in your spirit. For Jesus Christ said, if you look upon someone with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. So we know that we're called to higher standards as children of God. And so let me point out, if you really want to learn about marriage and the possibility of remarriage, you need to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells us that if a, let's say a person gets married, they're a Christian, well, let's, let's say two people are married, they're not saved, one of them gets saved, the other one says, you know, I didn't sign up for this Jesus stuff, I'm not interested in your God, I'm not interested in your Bible, I didn't sign up for this Jesus stuff, so they abandon their Christian spouse. Paul says, under that case, you're no longer under bondage, you are free to remarry. Listen to me. A widow is free to remarry. A divorced person, someone abandons them because of their Christian, their faith stand, they are free to remarry. If you've been married and you got a divorce, and let's say the one you were married to is now living with someone, shacked up or remarried, then the marriage has been dissolved. And because the marriage has been dissolved, you're free to remarry. The sin has already been committed. Everybody follow me? Yeah. 
Now, I know we'll be in better stuff next Sunday. I promise you. <laughs> promise you we'll preach, we'll, we'll preach better stuff next Sunday. But I, I, I have to look at what it's saying here. I, I've met husbands and wives married to each other that one of them are exactly like 2 Peter 2, 14, 2, 14, chapter 2, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Now, if there's a couple and you don't have grounds for divorce, but there's abusiveness, someone is abusing you mentally, someone is abusing you physically, if you are mentally abused, you're you're physically maybe threatened and you're mentally abused. I believe that it is well within your right to separate. But separate doesn't give you the right to date. But if you separate and you do not reconcile, you separate long enough and that buzzard's going to go commit adultery. That one that's mistreated you, that one that's abusive to you, whether it be a male or female, that one has been unfaithful uh, and hurt you and, and put, belittled you. You separate for your own sound mind. You separate for your own safety. You stay single, but I promise you, if you stay single, it's all going to come out in the wash. It's all going to come out in the truth. And eventually that person will go ricochet because their eyes are full of adultery. That person will go into a sinful lifestyle. And then when they do that, you are free to remarry. But you are not free to separate from your spouse and then play the dating game. That's not permissible in the scriptures. Unless it be for fornication, adultery, or rejection as a Christian, there is no other grounds for divorce, but there can be grounds for separation. Hello. Is this helping some of you? I hope this is helping some of you. Let me say to the widows, and I'm not a widow and don't ever want to be, but it, it, let me say to the widows, don't get in a hurry to remarry. Take your time. God may give you the gift of singleness. If he doesn't give you the gift of singleness, you're free to marry. But only in the Lord. Amen. That's what the Bible's saying. Amen? Yep. Now there's some young people in this room who are saying, oh brother, I picked the wrong morning to come. Don't you worry, sweetheart. This sermon will catch up with you down the road. Hello. See, the, the, the whole truth that Jesus is getting across is divorce is bad. It's ugly. And if you can keep your marriage together, that's God's will. But if it disintegrates, it's God's will that if you marry, only marry again in the Lord. And where you marry again in the Lord, then you make that marriage, you go for a godly marriage. Everyone in this room needs to go for a godly marriage. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're looking for a mate, don't go to the bar room to find one. Hello? She'll have hiccups and she'll be nasty as she can be. Or he will. He said, well, I'll come to the church and get one, you weasel. If you ain't a Christian, you just leave our girls alone. <laughs> Hello? Am I preaching now? I know scoundrels that come into the church to fight, try to find a wife, and they're worthless. They're not worth the powder to blow them to hell and back. But they come in and try to find some pretty girl in the church, and the first thing they do is they steal them out of the flock, then they go out and do their thing, and it's a big mess, and then they want to blame the church for it. Let me tell you, friends, if you're coming here to the church looking for a wife, you better, or a husband, you better get in this altar and get your facts straight, or you're going to tangle with me. Yeah. 
Amen? Amen. I'm still not so sure the father and mother shouldn't pick the... Never mind. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Yeah. Yeah. Hugh agrees with that. <laughs> Oh, you girls are in trouble now. <laughs> now, there's something very interesting in this scripture. Jesus brings the children back in focus. Remember prior, in chapter 18 and 19, he says, it'd be better if you offend a child that a millstone be cast around your neck, you cast into the de deepness of the sea. Remember, Jesus talked about take care of the children. Be good to the children. That's why divorce is so ugly. People are not good to the children. The lawyers are not good to the children. The, the, the divorce situation is not good to the children. Remarriage, if you blend a family together, sometimes it's not good for the children. It takes a special, Chris and Julie, it takes a special couple that can blend two families together and survive. And Chris and Julie, you've done a good job at it. They blended two families together. How many boys you got? Three, six boys. Three of them are yours. Three of them are Chris's. Well, it worked because they were boys. <laughs> Trust me, girls are easier to raise than boys. No, girls are harder to raise than boys. Let me restate that. I about stuck my foot in my mouth. Boys are easier to raise than girls. Yeah. So Jesus brings up the children again. Now, what are we going to do when we look at Jesus out of nowhere? He brings back the children. After he talks about eunuchs and he talks about divorce, he talks about adultery, talks about separation, then he comes and talks about children again. And I want to show you something that the Lord laid on my heart, and, and I know that it's God's will that I share this today because it's so important that we take good care of God's children. We need to take care of God's children. Look at verse 13 and 14 and 15. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid hands on them, the children, and departed thence. Oh, that Jesus would lay hands on my children. Oh, that Jesus would lay hands on my grandchildren. Oh, that Jesus would lay hands on all the children. Those hands that cleansed the leper, yeah. those hands that raised the dead, yeah. those hands that removed the fever in, in Peter's mother-in-law's life, those hands that, that reached out and touched the lame and they walked and they leaped for joy, those hands that touched the blinded eyes and opened up. Uh, Jesus, so many powerful hands. That why did all the parents keep bringing the children to Jesus? Well, look at his hands. That's why they kept bringing the children to Jesus Christ, so that Jesus Christ would put them, put his hands on them. Yeah. And that's why we need to get our children in church so Jesus can put his hands on them. Amen. In public school, wrong hands are on our children. In the government, wrong hands are on our children. I'm not saying there isn't good Christian teachers. They are. But I'm just saying that as the most part, the world doesn't have good, clean hands to lay on our children. Jesus needs to lay his hands on our marriage, on our children, on our life, on our heart. We need the hand of Jesus on our lives. Amen. Amen. Now, the Lord spoke this to me, and, and I want to share it with you because it's important that as we wrap this message up, it's important that you understand 
the singleness. Single, single is not the same as singleness. Singleness can be brought about by choice. It can be brought about by being birth, having birth without a sexual drive. It can be brought about by an accident. It can be brought about by a death of a spouse. Singleness can be brought about by a very nasty marriage, and you never could find your heart in your heart to remarry. Singleness is an amazing gift from God. Paul had the singleness gift, Apostle Paul. I think Apostle Paul at one time was married. I don't think he could have been part as a Pharisee without being married. I think Paul at one time was married because it was a requirement for the Pharisees to be married. They had to be 35 years old and had to be married. So something happened to Paul's wife. I know he didn't kill her. His wife may have abandoned him. That may be why you have 1 Corinthians 7. When someone leaves, the unbeliever leaves, then they're free to... I don't know, but I know this. Paul lived a life of singleness, but he once was married. Jesus was never married, so he lived a life of single. And he chose to live the life of singleness. Now, I say, what's this got to do with children? All right? Every family has a favorite uncle. All the children have a favorite uncle. Josh happens to be a favorite uncle. All the grandkids think Josh is, I mean, he's it. Now, now that's partly because the other two sons of mine not, don't live here. That's partly, be, partly because the other one lives in Florida and the other one that lives in Texas, he's living the life of singleness. He's living the life of being single and he's not interested in kids at all. But anyway... But Josh is the wowie zowie of all the grandchildren. <laughs> He's uncle. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Man, they love him. They come, to, they come to my house, they don't run to me, they run to uncle. <laughs> I'm second on the list. No, I'm third. They go to grandma. But anyway... What am I, Swiss cheese? Yeah. <laughs> but let me point out something. Let me point out something. Whether you're single, married, divorced, separated, remarried, widowed, or have the gift of singleness, you have a great responsibility to love and protect all children. Yes. Amen. That's what Jesus is trying to say here. He's trying to say, you need to take care of the children of God. Yes. If you were born without any sex drive and you're a eunuch by birth, you can have as many children as anyone that can normally have children. As I said, Galen, our firstborn, he came pretty quick, ten and a half months after we were married. The next one took two years, Misty, firstborn daughter. And then they just kept coming. <laughs> and then Judy got old, and they quit coming. And if she wasn't so old, we'd have more. Just, come on, get over it. <laughs> now, the children can be mixed. You can have children by a different marriage, children by another marriage. Children can be mixed. But the priority that Jesus gives us, whether you were born a eunuch, made a eunuch, live a eunuch, or you've chosen to be single or live the single Nuss lifestyle, or you're married, or you're divorced, or you're remarried, Jesus Christ is trying to say, the most important thing is not you, it's my children. Amen. That's what he's saying. The most important thing is not you. How many children do you think Jesus had, though he was never married? <laughs> More than we can count. 
How many children do you think Apostle Paul had? More than we can count. You can live the life of singleness and have children everywhere. In fact, you can live a life of singleness and be the favorite uncle. Or be the favorite aunt. Hello. Now, we're going to be in something else next Sunday morning, and I know many of you are very glad for this. <laughs> but let me say to you that have never been married, some of you are too stinking young to get married, so cheer up. You'll get there. Don't get in no hurry to get married. I mean, come on. Abraham waited until he was in his 90s to really get a family started. <laughs> Sarah. You don't have to get in no hurry. Just make sure you marry in the Lord. Yeah, don't ever marry someone thinking, well, I'll change them. No, you won't. They'll change you. Don't ever marry someone because you think they're cute. I've got news for you. Forty years will take care of the cute. <laughs> Forty years will slap the cute right out of that pretty face. So you better marry for something other than cuteness. You better marry for holiness. One marriage for life between a husband and wife. Because what? The, the beauty that grows on a woman, the beauty that grows on a man. It stopped growing on me. But anyway, the beauty that grows on a woman that grows on a man. The beauty will stop growing. Facially, outward. But as you're married, the beauty will grow inward. Amen. You hear me? When someone is married for years, some of you have been married much longer than Judy and I, 48 years going on. Some of you have been married much longer than that. But you will testify to this truth. Your spouse, whether it's a man or a woman, your spouse is getting more attractive and more beautiful every day. Amen. Don't ask the opinion of others because they won't agree with you. But beauty is inside and it grows. Amen? Amen. Someone said beauty's only skin deep, but ugly's plumb to the bone. Well, if you're happily married, beauty will grow to the bone. Amen? Amen? So let me say to the young men and the young ladies that's not married yet, don't get in no hurry. Let God bring you that person. Don't go places and look for a mate because if you go to the wrong places, you're going to connect with the wrong people. Don't try to make something happen. Let God bring you into that place. Now, you can look. There's nothing wrong with looking. Nothing wrong with seeking a mate. Eliezer went and found Isaac a mate. And if you want me to, I'll be your Eliezer. I'll go find you somebody. <laughs> I told some girl the other day she was wanting to get married, and I said, well, they're just running everywhere. Boys are everywhere. I'll just go get you one. <laughs> she, didn't like my, she didn't like my offer. <laughs> the first thing you need to check out is not the color of their eyes. The first thing you need to check out is not the color of their hair and not the beauty of their skin. The first thing you need to check out is if you're a Christian, that they are a Christian. Now, pretty, pretty goes a long way, but if they're not a Christian, ugly's going to take over. Amen? <laughs> and boy, is there some, there are some people in the show me state that just haven't been blessed that much, you know?
I like Andy Griffin. Andy Griffin Show. Man, anybody know Andy Griffin Show? Yeah, anybody ever know? I'm, I know some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, Barney, Five, Andy Griffin. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Shoot, everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I remember when Andy said to this real beautiful girl, he said, you know, the Lord just really has been good to you. He was talking about her looks. You have sure been blessed. The Lord has been good to you. Well, let me tell you, friends, if you're single, take your time. Make sure you find a Christian. If you're not a Christian, leave our girls or boys alone. Get right with God, then come back, and I'll give you a number to take. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hello? No, single is a beautiful thing, and singleness is even more beautiful. Yes. We've got some widows in this room right now. Your spouses have gone on. Some of you men, your wives have gone. Some of you ladies, your husbands have gone. And I admire you. I know you have loneliness, and I know you have grief, and I know you struggle. But I admire you in the life that you're living in singleness. It's very beautiful. Now, if you ever decide to get married, that's your business. The Lord says it's okay. But I'm here to tell you singleness, the gift of singleness, is a miracle that only a widow can endure or a widower can endure being alone. That gift of singleness. Now we're going to start preaching something next Sunday morning. Aren't you glad? <laughs> we're going to rip and snort and have a good time next Sunday morning. But I've had a pretty good time today. Yeah. With the exception of some of your looks. But anyway, <laughs> frowning at me. How many, know, how many know pastors need to talk about this? And I know some of you young people are uncomfortable because you're not where I'm at in some of the things I've said. But hear me, trust me, you'll be there someday. Yes. And you need to remember this sermon. Remember that it's not the end of the world if there's a divorce. There can be a rebuilding and a remarriage. Remember, it's not the end of the world if someone abandons you. It's not the end of the world. Because God will put his favor on you, and God will allow you to marry in the Lord. He'll work things out for you. He'll work it out for you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know widow, widows, uh, widows, ladies that are widows, indeed, they spend all their time with their grandchildren. There's nothing wrong with that. And then there's widowers that spend time with their grandchildren. There's nothing wrong. How many know that that is a gift from the Lord? But if you remarry and you're permitted to do that, you're going to take in some more children. And all children need to be treated the same. In love, in grace. Don't ever favor your child over another child. Don't ever favor your grandchildren over someone else's. They are a heritage of the Lord. And whether you're an uncle, divorced, remarried, or you're living a life of singleness, or you're single, your first priority is to love those children. Be good to them children. And by the way, the Bible says that if, you're, if you defile them child, if you hurt that child, It'd be better for a millstone to be put around your neck and you cast in the depth of the sea and you drowned. I mean, no, God's made it pretty clear. He's interested in his children. That not only counts for children that are little, that counts for children that are newborn in Christ. It counts for God's children. You need to care for each other, love each other. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Are you glad you came? All the older people are thrilled that I preach today. The younger are saying, okay, well, you know. 
We'll get you next Sunday morning. Please, don't give up on us. Don't abandon ship. Let the Lord speak to your heart. Your life, divorce is not the end of the road. Divorce doesn't make you a second-class Christian. There's a blessing that the Lord will give you. Stay strong in the Lord. Live for your God. Honor your God. And God will bless you. Altars open. You want to come talk to the Lord.